down. Um, I'm going to kick off with a bit of an icebreaker, which for those of you who haven't been to The Conduit before, this is how we like to start our events, just to get a bit of energy in the room. Um, so I'm going to go for a bit of a childish question here. So if you could turn to the person next to you, preferably someone you don't know and didn't come with, and ask each other what their fa your favourite confectionery of choice is. Okay, thank you. I hope you discovered something new about the person next to you. Um, I'd love to hear what everyone's choices were. Well, um, I'm not gonna take up any more of the time here because we have such an interesting discussion ahead of us. Thank you all for coming on a Monday evening and thank you especially to our panelists um, this evening. And I'm gonna hand straight over to Julianne who's the Managing Director of the Sustainable Restaurant Association who's gonna lead a super interesting discussion. So, Julianne, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone Hi. here. Hello. First of all, I need to say a huge, huge thank you to Will for your last minute kind of joining us in this conversation. Um, I know for those of you who um, had signed up to come to this event, uh, we had planned to have James Cochran, and he has come down with COVID. Um, and Sky has had a missed flight uh, this morning. So we've had two last minute cancellations and we were very, very, very pleased to hear that Will was keen to join us and has come straight from the restaurant and heading back to service. So, so um, chef's life uh, it is. But I'm really excited to have such a, a great panel joining for this conversation, the origins of which started when um, I joined Rose for an episode of The Conduits podcast um, a couple of months ago. And the day that we were speaking was right after the New York Times uh, article from Rene Redzepi that was announcing the closure of Noma um, two years in the future. <laughs> so I think we should probably note that. Um, and obviously there was kind of a flurry of headlines after that article that was um, kind of everywhere in food media talking about the future of fine dining and what does this mean and if Rene is saying that fine dining isn't sustainable then what, you know, what happens now? And I think that um, for a lot of people working in the industry, these aren't new conversations or new ideas. And um, I think there's, there have been um, a really good large handful of chefs that have been pioneering different ways of thinking about the future of restaurants um, and kind of grappling with some of these questions that Rene you know, pointed to when arguing that fine dining as it currently exists isn't sustainable into the future. Um, 
And of course, those are both questions of environmentally sustainable. How do we you know, ensure that we are sourcing ingredients and, and kind of creating a food system that uses ingredients that are uh, positive for the planet going forward, but also socially um, sustainable. And of course, the kind of real undercurrent of that article was financially sustainable as, as a huge piece of that. Um, so I'm really excited to be joined by three chefs who are each in restaurants that are thinking a bit more uh, deeply and creatively around what it means uh, to run a restaurant that is fit for a future that is good for both people and planet. Um, I'm going to let each of you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell the audience a little bit about your restaurant. Chantelle, go ahead. <laughs> yes, I'm first. Um, hi, I'm Chantelle. I have a restaurant just around the corner from Ivan's um, in Mayfair called Apricity, um, and we opened a year ago. Um, and yeah, really wanted to do things a bit differently with it. So very much about um, looking at how to be a bit more circular, so circular economy, um, and bringing people into that, which is something that probably in my past wasn't wasn't given much um, of a priority. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, looking at how to be a bit more positive with everything we do across the board. Um, yeah, that's probably us in a nutshell. Brilliant, brilliant, go ahead. Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm Will, uh, I own a restaurant called Fallow around the corner, um, with uh, Jack. Um, so we're, both, we're two chef owners. Inspiration kind of came about, um, we worked at a fine dining restaurant, which I won't name, um, uh, for a long time, and we kind of got a little bit, I guess, um, yeah, repeatedly got a little bit disenfranchised with the amount of wastage that you see in fine dining. Um, that kind of just led us to cook, cook uh, little dishes here and there, um, you know, in our in our break times and stuff. And from that, we um, we did a few series of pop ups. Um, I don't think our concept completely came from. Um, it wasn't planned, really. It, it's kind of evolved over time, to be quite honest. Um, now we're doing a lot of covers, and um, that kind of defines what we do. But we, we use a lot of um, English ingredients, local ingredients, as local as you can be in London, uh, forage ingredients, but also our, our menu and the way that we source our ingredients is usually um, sort of inspired by uh, some form of waste in, in the system. Um, so yeah. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Cheers. Brilliant, thanks. Hi, my name's Ivan, and I have a restaurant called Native, which is currently in Mayfair, uh, uh, near next to Claridge, as we always say, because everyone knows what that is. Um, you know, Native's had many iterations. We've started off in Neil's Yard, um, we moved to London Bridge, we moved to an island out in Essex called OC during the lockdown, and now we're in Mayfair, which is somewhere that I didn't think I'd find myself, but you know, we've made we made home there, you know, it's kind of all part of our journey. We're still an independent um, restaurant, so it's kind of like rolling with the punches pretty much of the, the last few years. Um, and our kind of ethos is to let the land dictate to us what we serve. We do a lot of um, foraging, kind of what it was founded on foraging. I grew up in South East London, so I didn't know anything about wild food. And kind of as I learned, it was a way for me to cook with these exciting new ingredients that people couldn't buy. Um, and you had to go and kind of learn about it. And you know, you're still, I'm still learning to this day, kind of eight years down now. Um, so yeah, sustainability plays a huge part in what we do. Naturally, really, as a restaurant, you have to be sustainable to make it work, really. So it's, I mean, for me, it's not something that is a new thing in, in the restaurant but it's industry, but it's great that everyone's kind of like cutting onto it now and, and you know, highlighting how important it actually is. So um, yeah, please come to Native. <laughs> So I was saying uh, when I was chatting to Will briefly earlier that you guys are all sort of, I would say maybe fine dining adjacent in, in your restaurants. Um, a lot of you have fine dining backgrounds um, and that sort of experience and that level of precision going into some of your food, but not necessarily what you would call fine dining. Um, for, for the audience and to kind of help set the stage, could one of you guys give us a working definition of what you would call fine dining versus, you know, the food that you guys are doing. It's kind of a phrase I avoid. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think we probably all do, which is why we're here. Um, we prefer fun dining. I think fun dining, to... yes, absolutely. I think it has a very, from my perspective, it's got a very traditional slant. Yeah. And I think there's a certain echelon, a certain generation of chefs that 
that was what they were about, and it probably was very intertwined with Michelin. Um, and I, I, I would say, potentially controversially, um, that perhaps um, things were sacrificed for... So the, the food. Yeah. And I think the food, because I, I think for me, <coughs> food should be imperfect and it should be inconsistent because it's food, it's natural, it's grown, it's a, it's a you know, living, breathing thing. So to try and <coughs> create something that's consistent and reject things that aren't consistent... Um, just seems really counterintuitive. So I think for me, it's yeah, that sense of um, as you said, precision, yeah, consistency, yeah, um, potentially at the detriment to what is what sustainable, is <laughs> yeah, I yeah, guess, yeah. in some ways. Um, yeah, and there's probably certain things that define it. Price point probably is is one of the most and sort defining of tasting yeah. menu format and kind of like you said a bit Michelin driven French yeah. derived in in I a lot of kind of actually say so yeah backgrounds and and I think maybe from there like you say um, lots of waste being created and in, in striving towards a certain. Um, uh, replicability of that kind of precise food, yeah? Yeah, I think waste and also just, um, yeah, from my perspective, probably a, a, a um, an ability to kind of not involve the people as much, yeah. to kind and of, to yeah, their detriment. That, it's, yeah. it's, one, it's one of those, like, for me, anyway, personally going through the fine dining world, uh, it was an amazing um, thing for my personal development yeah. and, dis and discipline as a chef. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that whole idea of making things perfect that aren't perfect, like you say, <laughs> is, um, is always at the detriment to someone and it's usually, it's usually the staff. It's usually the hours that you work and um, like I say, I won't talk about any, any restaurants, but I think there's, a, there's been an attitude shift, especially among, among uh, chefs and I think even to an extent business owners about how they want to run their restaurants and, and how that's dictated. Um, so yeah, when you say people and uh, planet, like the staff come into it, they have to. Yeah. And profit has to come into it as well. So, yeah, 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 yeah. For me, it's a bit kind of murky what fine dining is. I think yeah. I'm a self-taught chef, so growing up, the kind of pinnacle of, of the chefs that I used to watch in Great British Menu, these were all fine dining chefs. Yeah. But I think a lot of it is to find buy Michelin and and buy the world's fifty best. Like there's no sort of guide to these are fine dining restaurants because they have white tablecloths right. anymore. They might have been right. at some point, yeah. but no, you know, no one ever had a white tablecloth. But they are fine dining. But they, you know, they still certain restaurants will have graffiti yeah. on the walls. They'll play hip hop music while you're eating. Like, but they're still fine dining. So for me, it's kind of a, a murky definition of expensive food. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start then with this idea of uh, crafting something imperfect into this perfect thing at the detriment of someone. Um, and, and the fact that we're starting to, I think, create much more public awareness around um, the dynamics within a kitchen. And I think where, um, where behaviors were once glorified, that like, the, you know, you kind of got the Gordon Ramsay um, on TV, you know, Hell's Kitchen kind of yelling at staff glorified for entertainment, I think we're starting to see a real shift in how, in public perception of that behavior. Um, and obviously then there's a generation of chefs that are starting to think differently about how to run their kitchens. Um, how are you guys thinking about, what does it mean to run a kitchen that is more uh, equitable to your staff or, or treats your, your staff differently from maybe those kitchens that you came up in? Um, so, yeah, so um, when Fallow opened, well, the first pop-up we were working, you know, all of the chefs were working five and a half days a week, and we've now managed to get that down to uh, three and a half days. Um, so for us, the thing that we sort of instill in the chefs that we've got is that we, to, to get the best in the talent pool, we instill the fact that they need to be building their own brand alongside okay. of us. So um, I encourage them all to do social media. We, we engage. Our social is focused on them as well. Um, we do a whole thing about ask it, asking the chefs. Um, so we, we just train them to be uh, not just chefs there, but also kind of think of themselves as a 
personal brand and as a business, and we encourage that. So a lot of our chefs do pop-ups in their spare time, and we will help with the ingredients and cost of that and competitions and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think fundamentally, um, when you've worked five and a half days, six days, and you've worked till three in the morning, so you can't learn. I don't think you're productive. I don't think you get along with people very well. Um, I know I don't, anyway. Um, so three and a half days for me is just that. That's what that's our investment in them and their future, and it allows them to grow and it allows them to to learn in a more conducive and a nicer atmosphere. Um, I think it's a more sustainable approach uh, yeah. to building up your team. Kind of allowing for that rest or accounting for that rest in, yeah, your, in your model. Mm. And do you guys manage that by by closing more? I mean, how? No, or, we're, we're how seven days a week and we're about to okay. have breakfast, but we have a, we have a huge team. Um, yeah. So we have we have. Uh, 45 chefs now. So wow. It's a, it's a big old squad. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it comes with a lot of challenges. Like, you know, for example, we, we, we don't, I was on sections in fine dining restaurants where you're picking herbs for the first eight months yeah. and chopping up bread and butter, the perfect dimension, yeah. you know. Uh, we move them after three months, which is a massive operational strain because mm. they've just learnt section and then they're, they're off and you blink and it's, it's over. Um, but you can promise them that in two years with us, They'll have learned bread, butchery, fish butchery, sauces, chocolate work, ice cream. And that's, that's what we give to them. And then in return, you know, they work hard. And when they're in the work, they, they really work. And are you finding that that's helping you keep them? Yeah, we've got an, uh, um, yeah, the best retention that I've ever seen in a restaurant, that's which amazing. is awesome. It's great. That's really, amazing. really good. It's really quite cool. challenging, you know. Yeah. Operationally, like rotor wise, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Chantal, how are you how are you thinking about that with your team? So we have a much smaller much smaller team. Um, but I think for me a few of the things that I yeah, I guess one of the one of the big one of the good words that I like to use was kind of unlearning. Um, to kind of unlearning what I'd been taught, what I'd been told was the right way to run a business, was the right way to, to kind of get the most out of people. Um, so I, when I, with opening a prestige, I, I had the opportunity. Obviously, COVID also brought that to light because things completely shifted. So for me, it was about how can I do things differently that will actually benefit, you know, A, the people, but also that then has the knock-on effect of benefiting the business completely um, because of retention, because of happy people, you know, all the things that, that we kind of know but aren't necessarily put into practice. So for us, we... Um, yeah, for me, the kind of deal breaker with my lease was that I would only do a five-day operation. Um, I wouldn't do a seven-day operation because for me personally, even my own mental health was actually I need two days of it not being in the back of my mind. Even if I'm not there, yeah. it's still in the back of my mind that yeah. things are happening, people are there, you know, there's all the, yeah, there's so many things that go into a restaurant. So for me, that was kind of, so we do Tuesday to Saturday only, so it means everyone also has a weekend off, a weekend yeah. day off which is important if they've got partners that are working Monday to Friday, family, all those yes. sorts of things, kids, yeah. So that was really important. Um, and also, for me, the thing that always made me uncomfortable about our industry was service charge. Yeah. So I decided to remove it, and we just included it in our pricing. Um, so that that's not... Yeah, I always found it weird that a, a guest could dictate what someone took home each yeah. month. Yeah. Because um, I don't think there's any other industry where that happens. So that was another kind of big part, which has a lot of financial repercussions for the business. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it actually it's it's very democratic. It's very everyone knows what they're going to be to be getting. Um, and then we just yeah, I, I try and kind of think about ways of, of the things that potentially I never got to have when I was coming up through the ranks in those restaurants. So last Tuesday we closed the restaurant um, for the day and we went to an, um, an urban farm, a not-for-profit farm in Greenwich called Satopia, which is amazing if anyone wants volunteering days or anything. It's an incredible place to go. So we, went and we did three hours of digging, weeding, planting, um, just as a team. Um, and then we kind of had a, a bit of a chat about what we're going to do for the next year ahead and then went out for dinner. Um, so kind of celebrated our birthday for us rather yeah. than actually doing it for our guests, which sometimes I think a lot of restaurants think more about their guests rather than their, their team. team. And obviously they're both really important factors for us to yeah. be sustainable. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for me, and it's, I think, as I haven't said, it's, it's learning and it's still kind of learning. And, you, you know, when you're responsible for, for people, 
you yeah you want to kind of get the the best out of it and then you have this contrasting thing of trying to make a business work so it's all these things factors that come into it but yeah. I think it's just about um, yeah treating it as if it's as if it is something that um, you know is inherent and actually again that sense of kind of purpose yeah. to it and actually saying well what are all the things that matter um, and how can we kind of bundle them up and create a business that, that can A, survive, yeah. <laughs> is financially sustainable, as we mentioned, yeah. is really important, um, but then also can have the everything else that, that goes with it. Yeah. And I think what I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of ask Ivan the same question and how you're thinking about people, but one of the themes that I'm hearing from, from both of you guys is thinking less just about how your team performs for your guests, but instead how you can create a team that thrives in their own ways. Um, And that's this aspect of not just helping you become a more sustainable restaurant and that you retain in, in your team, but also thinking about the industry, I think, as a whole and how you're creating an ecosystem for, for thriving in the restaurant sector, which I think is a really important mindset shift that is really necessary as we start to think about what the future of restaurants looks like. Um, Ivan, wondering how you guys think about, about your team and the role of your team. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what Shanti said about unlearning because when I started Native, I just started, I did pop-up restaurants, so I had none of these kind of like predetermined formulas or routes to follow. Yeah. So we just kind of like worked when we needed to work and and, yeah. and then I was fortunate enough to get my first actual kitchen job was at River Cottage, which was, as you can imagine, just like heaven yeah. in the countryside, so <laughs> yeah. laid back, just kind of cooked what you wanted to cook and it was like a really nice kind of first sort of jump into the food world and there we kind of four days work and you got three days off and we've kind of stuck with that the whole way through and nice. always constantly speaking to our staff and saying, you know, if you want to do split shifts, you can, but most of them are like, no, we just want to get our work done yeah. while we're here, yeah. concentrate on it and then we can go and do our own things in, in our kind of time off. Um, I think what we found at the moment is with the, all the increases in costs that we've decided to kind of reduce the size of our team okay. and pay the guys more that we have and I like, really invest in those guys and it, it, for us it's kind of working well because they feel that they have more power they feel part of the team a little bit more yeah um and you know it's kind of makes it much more efficient and, and makes it a tighter team for us really like, we don't need 114 people yeah so it's going to be a lot harder to do on a kind of larger scale but um it's yeah nice to have those kind of tight knit unit that we can really invest in and you know take foraging take we're going to visit a winery next monday and some of days off and, and we do yeah five days and closed Sunday, Monday, pretty much. Okay. We've kind of toyed with the idea of opening, but it's just not worth it at all for mental health reasons for ourselves and for the staff, you know, as yeah. as everyone knowing what they're doing. Yeah. And, you know, if, if people want to come to your they'll come on the days you're open, pretty much. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious, I suppose, um, both of you guys, or all of you guys actually, have mentioned the sort of financial sustainability accompanying um, the staffing costs. And... Um, staff is obviously a huge part of the cost of running a restaurant. Often when we talk about restaurants uh, as the SRA, we we talk about the fact that at the end of the day, it's a people business. And so, you know, when we're trying to talk about sustainability in restaurants, it's really about behavior change in people than not about some academic kind of box checking because um, as opposed to kind of creating a net zero law firm or something like that, we're a business where it's actually a lot of little small decisions that a lot of people are making day in and day out. Um, and I guess I'm curious both with with your experience, Chantal, of eliminating the service charge and then these kind of shifts in Rhoda and the way that you manage um, smaller teams or, or bigger teams. I'm struck by the fact that this has come up when I'm speaking to chefs everywhere in the world over the last year. So I think we have narratives here in the UK that we've got the staffing crisis in restaurants and that Brexit is, that it's highly related to Brexit, but I think it's actually fundamentally a staffing crisis in restaurants all over the world. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're not usually conducive to um, a life for for people. Um, and post COVID, there's a lot of people that have left the sector because they recognize that like, actually I would like to see my kids every once in a while, or I would like to not have a wage that was determined on what my guests have chosen to pay me. 
Um, but these are challenging decisions for you guys to make as restaurant owners, and particularly in eliminating the service charge. I wondered if you had had any backlash to that. Um, I know that Danny Meyer, when he tried it in New York, reversed his yeah. decision on it because this, not because he couldn't sustain it for the business, but because the staff kind of decided that actually they could make a lot more in a tipping, yeah. in a tipping restaurant. Um, so I just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on the challenges you faced in making that decision. Yeah, I think for me it was um, quite a bit of weighing up of factors because the, the kind of frustrating thing about it is that we pay more VAT as a business because we pay VAT on everything that we take versus you don't pay VAT on service charge as right. a business. Right. So we had to kind of factor that into our price point to say obviously we've got to factor in service charge and VAT effectively. So it's yeah. kind of look... From the outside looking in, I was really, really concerned before we opened that we would seem overly expensive. Okay. Um, but actually, touch wood. Thank you for sitting on it. <laughs> yeah. um, we we get very little backlash with we get very little comments in regards yeah. to our yeah. price point actually. Um, and I also, you know, I'm not of that um, ilk where I'm like, right, let's just you know charge what we get to a point where we just do it until people complain. It's like actually, no, we we need to provide value for what we do. Right. Um, and yes, there was you know there's times where I think oh gosh it would be lovely to to be able to be so buoyant that you can pay people you know amazing amounts of money, right. um, but I think when it comes to yeah and I think having purpose to it it's actually well hold on you know and we all you know that is our for a business generally that's the only metric we're all aware of and the only one that as a society we we look at is yeah. okay is a business successful well is it financially successful. Um, so actually to go, yeah, around from that and say, well, actually, what can you, yeah, what can you invest into people? How can you give them something that they are going to then, you know, thrive? Yeah. Um, so I think it does all come down to that. And I think sometimes the, the balancing act, which there is always, you know, there's a lot of things we do where it's like, oh, gosh, okay, this is going to cost more, but it's true to our ethos or, yeah. you know, all these questions that you have to constantly ask yourself. Um but at the end of the day, if you can all agree on it as a team of how to move forward and actually think it's the right thing. Yeah. Um, and I think also just in terms of that retention yeah. piece, it is, you know, we have, we've had a couple of people leave because we're a year, well, not necessarily because we're a year, they've just had these amazing opportunities and one's gone to work at a farm, one um, moved because of her partner. So all they're like really good reasons and you're like yeah. actually genuinely really happy for them. And so yeah. to kind of celebrate that movement and allow new things to come in is also... I think really important. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on that particular metric, it is very much about just making it work. Um, and obviously, with all the increasing costs, you've just got to balance balance it all. But I think being aware of it um, and just monitoring it pretty pretty constantly is is yeah. quite important. Yeah. It feels like one of those things that. Like the whole, if the whole industry could move together on getting rid of service charge, right? Or if the government could move together on getting rid of service charge, then it would be better for everyone entirely. And it's it's a it's one of those things that's a challenge for those that are yeah. early adopters or first movers, because obviously there's there's these financial unintended consequences, like you know, government not really thinking through the fact that then it's VATable as yeah, opposed to yeah, they get to, way more from it. So yeah. they should be like, oh, so there great, should you be can these... just have ten percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. still have service charge, um, yeah. and it, we sat down with the staff and they asked for it. They said for, they want to keep, keep it. it. Yeah, uh, I think the problem came where jobs were advertised the wage included the service and yeah. estimation. So we advertise the base rate. We advertise this is what you're going to earn base all your life decisions around what you're earning. Yeah. Everything else is a bonus, and you have to live. That's how yeah. you should live a life. And they 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 chose to go that way because they see the opportunity for them to earn more money if they want to give that extra level of service and 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 sell more, I guess, really. And, and again, it, we yeah. completely left it up up to them because I don't take service charge and leave it as image and the business partner. It's only for right. the staff, and we don't touch right. it. And they manage it themselves. So I don't see a penny of it. So you know, if they they're happy doing that. We kind of let them let them do. It. We have toyed with the idea of of trying to go sort of Chantel's way and. Um, probably not smart enough at maths to, to work out how to do it yeah. <laughs> well I think that's the I think that's the challenge and I think that's the that was the um, outcome in New York when when Danny Meyer did it was ultimately staff opted to keep it but so it's a it's a challenging ecosystem particularly right now when it is a um, 
employees market and you know there's pretty much you can go and leave and work in any restaurant that you want to at the moment but i think you'll be getting lost in the the service charge it should be the the advertisement of the job and making sure that's that's true that we're right. advertising the right wage the right holiday the right hours and not kind of you know because you can advertise a wonderful wage but make them work 15 hours 16 hours a day right. and then your actual average wage comes right down so that's not true either really so it needs to work we need to find a way of managing that more than service charge i'd say right right yeah, that ties back in with your sustainability of yeah living and having a sustainable employment yeah uh, sorry, uh, sustainable staff yeah team really i think there are changes coming in on yes. yeah both, there are both of these things i think the tipping lord went through the house of lords recently, yeah it did and i think there's something coming in which is going to state the um the exact amount on job offers yeah yep. um but then you could also just put a job range up of yeah, thirty-five to sixty-five thousand pounds. Chef Depay, Chef Depay, as well. From our, our side, we we made the decision as a business to raise our service charge from thirteen point five to fifteen uh, okay. percent, uh, just with the amount of staff that we've got, and also the the level of service that they provide consistently. Yeah. Uh, we thought that was the right way to go for our business, and to be honest, the trunk retention's been much greater, and yeah. we distribute um, every three months. Um, that's how we've done it for a while um might change with um tip and law i'm not yeah. sure um we're just constantly fluid about what's going on in the industry and these changes are going to have a profound impact in the way that, yeah, that yeah, we yeah. all we all work um yeah. not, we're not i don't think anyone's very very clear on how it's gonna i don't know i'm looking no, to you guys no now. not not so, hugely i think there's yeah. there's some insights starting to come out about how um what you need to be aware of as a business yeah. and the ways that it's going to impact you we mean things around transparency on yeah. A, yeah, and yeah. stuff. So yeah, it's the senior members of the team getting paid yeah. vast sums of money with the lower members. Yeah, right. Which is completely fair enough. So yeah. it should the fifteen percent service charge for us. We have a backlash off of customer reviews occasionally because uh, we do high volume of customers. Um, but I think it's I think it's a perfectly fair thing to do, and yeah. the staff benefit from it. So yeah, it's great. Let's shift gears a little bit to talk about the uh, the food side of things. And, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit before about this idea of fine dining being about wrestling something that is imperfect into something perfect. Um, and, you know, Will, when you were talking about your background, you mentioned about the waste and that sort of inspiring your journey to get you to follow. Um, Talk a little bit about your perspective on the ingredients that you're sourcing and what a kind of ideal, I guess, of a food of a food future for our restaurants could look like in terms of the food that we serve uh, people. Do you want to start? Yeah, Ivan, oh, sorry. You, you, you start. Well, I'm not ready now. Um, uh, caught me out there. Um, so ingredients and and obviously you guys do something quite quite unique at native and you're using a lot of foraged ingredients a lot of um wild ingredients correct uh, yeah. talk about your perspective on um that. so the kind of the more fine dining side of what we do in the taste of menu works really well with the forage ingredients because a lot of what we get is only available for a week we can only get 10 portions of alexander buds or something like that um so to be able to offer that in a taste of menu style um, is much more efficient for waste and um, it's a lot easier to sort of dictate. When we, on our kind of a la carte dishes, we sometimes hold back some of the forage dishes because, you, you know, we could be sitting there for a few days holding on to them and not sell them and then, you know, it's something that I've gone out and foraged myself and then it's going to waste because no one's buying it. So for me, that kind of taste of menu you find out is really a way to showcase, you know, the native journey and this is what it is and this is why this ingredient grew next to this ingredient that's why they're together. So for me, it has a very important part of kind of what we're we're doing um but having an avocado and kind of a bit more casual it may, allows us to use some of the kind of like if we're going to save the the nice loin of the deer we can use the shoulder on a in a sausage roll for example in, in, on the avocado dish so there's a lot it's a, really, it's a really fun way to work pretty much to let as i said let the land dictate to us let the farms tell us this is what we have ready this is what you're going to serve and you know you have a lot of what we call like braising meat a lot of meat that you have to try and yeah. use up in in creative ways but um that's kind of the way we cook and and it allows us to get creative if i could order caviar and truffles and whatever i wanted i probably wouldn't be half as creative for what i do it'd be quite mundane and boring for me but the fact that when i get to january and i go okay i've got beetroots and artichokes like what am i going to do how am i going to make a menu out of this sort of stuff it's exciting for me and we come up with 
artichoke desserts and yeah. beetroot desserts and all sorts of kind of mad stuff and it is putting those restrictions on our menu that kind of I guess help kind of get us where we are and kind of think outside the box and come up with some of the weird stuff that we, we do yeah. like squirrel serving squirrel we were talking about squirrel earlier <laughs> on which is um, we it was mad we went so as I said I worked with a cottage and they they've served squirrel people have been serving squirrel for 10 years it's nothing new but at this one time we decided to do like a, a squirrel a deconstructed squirrel lasagna kind of yeah. nonsense and um <laughs> And it went, it just went mad. It went viral. Press on that, yeah, didn't you? we had people <laughs> flying over from Germany. It ended up on page three of the Sun. This is a lo lo lovely lady, and then we had the, our lasagna with a squirrel tail coming out of it. It's like, look, my mum made it, kind of thing. Uh, I think Piers Morgan wanted to try it. And I mean, we, as I was saying to Will before, though, it was really important for us that it didn't become a gimmick. Like, yeah. we we spoke to Vice. I think we spoke to the BBC, and that was it. Everything else, kind of like kind of the viral hype about it really well. So we didn't yeah. want it to be, you know, it's, it's, in, it's in, uh, necessity to eat them. They are, you know, a source of protein that goes to waste every every year. Um, and so for us, it's really important that, you know, food needs to have a narrative for me. I think there's a lot of a lot of menus now are dictated by TikTok and Instagram and what yeah. we see. And we're all kind of eating the same, same food. I mentioned a lot of the same stuff where, you know, a dish should have a reason. Normally, it's a cultural reason that's derived from a sustainable reason. Like, you know, you have an excess of this in your culture, you need to use this, and then we come up with a wonderful dish. And I think we're losing that a little bit. And I think, again, with Michelin and fine dining, where people are seeing what Michelin are awarding uh, and, and yeah, sorry, rewarding. Yeah. So we're all trying to cook the same stuff so we get our Michelin style as well. And I think yeah. we're just going down this horrible sort of mundane route now of serving the same food and we're losing that kind of reason yeah. to be almost a little bit yeah are you guys changing your menu weekly daily uh we we try and change it monthly monthly but it does, doesn't happen it's a nightmare it changes every day pretty much <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we try and have a skeleton structure of, kind of this is what we want to serve this is the ingredients we're highlighting yeah and then you know the kind of styles of farms we work with they can message you within a day and be like oh sorry no parsley today and you go yeah. okay well every dish has got parsley on what am i going to do yeah so we're kind of changing and chopping and you know, various like the, the the it's too stormy out to go and die for scallops. So we have to be we're trying to get a kind of like um like a core kind of amount of dishes that we can chop and change throughout the month and yeah. be a bit more flexible because it's not sustainable to to run a restaurant that changes its menu every day at all. Yeah. Because it involves me having to be Redesign. there twenty four seven yeah. and checking each dish. Lots of paper. Lots yeah. Of paper, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not a sustainable way to run a restaurant when we. Launch native, we're like, we're going to change the menu every week. Yeah. And it's, it's Not very hard. Well. I know Pigeon do it, and I know the chefs there, and they say it's very, <laughs> very hard to do. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, a, that's this interesting concept, right, about part of being able to be more responsive to the ingredients, being able to be res more responsive to the fact that food is imperfect as opposed to perfect means having to be responsive when there's changes on the farm and... Um, recently had a conversation with Callista from Flourish Produce and she was talking about how, you know, the real effects of climate change on the farm and the fact that um, these climate events, uh, heat waves and, you know, short, sharp rain showers and all this sort of stuff are really affecting the yields that you're planning for as a farmer. And so part of it um, in being a chef is being able to be reflexive to those, to those changing demands. But like you say, having to be able to have some level of consistency so that it's not a constant <laughs> game of having to write new menus and, and redesign. Um, well, how do you guys, I mean, that approach yeah. on Zero Waste? Honestly, that, when I speak about it, it actually gives me like anxiety. <laughs> anxiety. anxiety. <laughs> it, it's just, um, yeah, we, we don't change the menu that often. Yeah. We change the garnishes seasonally. But in order to construct a menu that's both, well, you know, sustainable and that we can produce for 550 people a day sometimes. Yeah, because like you guys have a big people, restaurant. Um, is, it's a massive challenge. Now, it's so interesting because when we first started, we were a little bit smaller and um, it was always like, oh God, we ran out of cod eggs again or, or we ran out of this second class ingredient again. And, but with scale, it's actually helped. Okay. So, so it allows us, and we're, we, we've got a big prep kitchen. So it allows us to go to a, a supplier now so for example i'll use an example of a cod's head so the cod's head came on the menu when um i literally asked um, my fish supplier what was in the bin he sent me all the contents of the bin 
the cod's head went up on the menu for lunch. It was served for Faye Mashler for dinner. And after that, she, she wrote a good review, thankfully, about it. Um, and then it, for, for about a year, it was a, a game of cat and, like, cat and mouse, trying to find every cod's head in London. <laughs> um, and now it's uh, amazing. So we work with a guy, uh, Henderson Seafood. I'm sure you, you're aware of him, but super sustainable guy. And he now, it's, it's a, a fleet of six and seven ships who send direct to us. Wow. So we went to the fisherman, well, he went to the fisherman and said, um, what would you need to do for you to send all the cod, ho- cod heads that you're cutting off at, at sea currently to a fallow restaurant? And yeah. that was, you know, £3.25 a kilo, which is what we pay for our cod heads right now, uh, which is a very, you know, it's a very good price. Yeah. Um, and it's a hell of a lot of meat, you know. Yeah. Some of these cod heads are like 1, 1, 1. 1.2 kilos when they arrive, wow. they're monsters. Um, so, yeah, so, so with that, it's, it, for us, it's like um, if, we put, if we were to change our dairy cow supply, we have, we have a... a it's a big dairy farm in, in Wexford, Ireland, yeah. and we have to have a consistent product for the amount of customers that we're serving. Uh, for a long time, we were using a few different suppliers, and they were coming from different parts of Scotland. So scale has allowed us to work direct with that farmer, and they, they send yeah. us the animals in whole, which is really important because we can see the quality. We can age them as we see fit. We can separate them all up. Um, it takes a lot of work yeah. getting in whole animals, but we can di- work direct with, with games, so we get regularly, you know, four deer a week and it's super sustainable amazing meat um so yeah scale in that way for us has helped because for example we're working with uh, spent hens at the moment spent hens only can come in a pallet yeah so we we take the pallet we freeze wow. them down and then we use them we constantly roast the bones through the oven um, and we use the breast meat to make kebabs um if we didn't have a huge it's space cheap, it's cheaper to buy those than it is to buy a one, fish chicken bones one pound 20 a ki- one pound 20 a kilo wow for a spent hen which wow. is cheaper than carrots at the moment um it's the largest industrial waste in <coughs> one of the largest industrial waste in the industry um and spent hens don't just mean it doesn't just mean um intensively farmed yeah it, it means it's Anywhere everything that's everything that lays, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. The, the lays, a, lays an egg so it can be an organic and most most people I won't uh, shame them but like really really premium egg producers just incinerate uh, in our SPCA facilities wow. um, yeah so there's these huge and endemic um, the, the one we're working at the moment is a blooming um, fish frankfurter with cod trim because uh, um, Seashore is the largest importer of Icelandic cod who portions their cod into supermarket packets and they've got six tons of metric tons of pure white cod trimming in their freezer, wow. in their chest freezer. Um, yeah, so, so that's how we kind of construct our menu. Yeah. Um, there's loads of other things that keep you up it, at night, whether or not that's ethical or not. Well, it's so interesting um, because I think when people think about zero waste restaurants, you, often people are thinking about within the rec- restaurant ecosystem, like, you know, how, how are you using the, the, the byproducts of what you, al- what you also have? And you guys are thinking much more systemically about yeah. waste. And, yeah, it's, and it's just endemic waste throughout yeah. the whole um, system. And Across the chain. because of the scale of the business, so we need a consistent product. Yeah. So if we come up with a fish sausage, sausage we need to know that that product is always available and yeah. it's always going to waste. Yeah. So it speaks a lot about, like, you know how screwed up the system is to be honest um, yeah. but it is still going in the bin so it's a, it's a valuable food resource that if we can convert it into something yeah. that tastes delicious so the customer's happy that um, makes us profit which is super important for our business yeah. Um, yeah, and is sustainable in the way that zero waste so that's a win win yeah. for us I want to talk about two, I mean, I'm conscious of time and we're getting close to seven and I could easily keep talking and having this conversation with you guys for a few hours, um, but I've got a couple of uh, key things I want to pick up on before maybe opening it up to see if anybody has any questions for for you. Um, the first is that we've talked about award bodies throughout this, and I think that's an inherent piece of this picture around fine dining and what does fine dining mean um, is rewards by Michelin initially, 50 Best, all of these other kind of um, awarding bodies recognizing you. Um, Chantel, you guys have just gotten your green star. Um, and <laughs> round of applause. Um, if you could share with us what it means, that would be great. Um, but I think, uh, I think there's this question about what, what would a positive future look like for awarding bodies? Because I think 
that um, there's this tension out there where on the one hand, I think most of us have recognized that these awarding bodies are problematic going, you know, in, in who they award, how they award, but they also serve a really important purpose in the ecosystem because when you get awards, it brings people, it brings tourism, it does all of these kind of things to put attention on your restaurant. Um, I've just come back from, from traveling over Easter in, in Colombia and recognizing that some of these restaurants that had made it onto the 50 best Latin America list is life-changing for not just their restaurant, but also for their city and, you know, for, for kind of the way that um, cities get recognized and put on the map. What, in your opinion, could a positive future be? What, what should restaurant, what should these awards be looking at? How could we, how could we rethink what that could look like in order to, to award positive steps forward for the industry? Yeah, I think there is, there's a lot of work to be yeah. done um, because there's a lot of smoke and mirrors from, yeah. from all of them, I would say. Um, there's also a lot of um, skewed uh, views. So I would say certain things are looked at, certain things aren't even taken into account, certain places aren't visited. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of work to be done. Um, and I kind of feel like there's a, yeah, there, there's something there for an, a body, I don't know what, to come along and actually, you know, be a bit more robust in how yeah. it does award. Um, and, you know, I think it was um, Esma Khan who said a couple of years ago that, you know, Michelin should look at how people treat their teams and if there's kind of quite, if there's, yeah, if, if there's evidence that, that's not good, then they shouldn't, they, all their styles should be taken off them. Um, and I think that that is something that is brushed under the carpet. Yeah. And I think sometimes, and you know, I, I get that dining out should be an enjoyable experience. You shouldn't necessarily, you know, sometimes you don't want to think about what's going on behind those closed doors because you're there to have a lovely time. Right. Um, but I think if it's brought to your attention, that's probably a different story. So I do feel that there's, there's a lot of space yeah. Um, how that looks and, and what that looks like, is, it's very hard. Because yeah. um, I think quite a few of these things that we've even talked about tonight are quite subjective. And right. you know, how do you um, quantify what someone's doing for their team? How do you quantify what someone's doing with their, their waste unless you're in there kind of measuring and you know, seeing what they put out each day? Yeah. Um, so I think it's a very nuanced area. Yeah. That, that needs needs some thought. Yeah. Um, and I think also, yeah, how willing people are. And I think if you look at a lot of these bodies, well, probably Michelin is, is the main one, you know, it's it's ancient. It just goes back for many, many, many years. And actually the original reason for it being established was actually quite, you know, one that we would all like to know that, you know, you're going to this place, this city or this town, this is where we think you should check out. The road trip guide. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> really literally, which day. is really the cool. Company with um, the road trip guide. I think that has changed with social media, right? Um, rightly or wrongly, and, or you know, for good or for bad. Um, but I think it's it's just yeah, I haven't quite figured out what the yeah what it should be. But I yeah. feel that there should be something, and I also feel that um, yeah, th there's a lot of um, operators that are doing pretty awful things yeah. that don't get. You know, th there's no kind of communication about that. Um, yeah. I think sometimes ones that are doing great things, there's not enough communication about yeah. um, just from media perspective of wanting to hero the same old and the same old image in person. Yeah. Um, so I think a shift is, is yeah, it is definitely needed. I think what you said about having to show that you have a, a happy team, a sustainable team, like, I think it, to show that you're a, a sustainable financially business as well, should it's important for Michelin, like you can't certain missions are getting awarded these stars and they're for me they're idols like Noma, Blue Hill Farm where I went to work, they're like the pinnacle and what I strive to be and try to like recreate that business myself to find out that actually it doesn't work as a business model. When I've been I've been following that business model for the last eight years. I'm like, hang on a second, this isn't right. Like it, it can't actually work. I think so it's important that these these businesses aren't put on a pedestal when they're not actually functioning businesses. Yeah. They're running on free labor. Yeah, 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 yeah. 100%, yeah. So, so I guess 
For a little of our perspective, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that as a chair, um, or if I'm meant to just <laughs> facilitate, but obviously one of the things that we do at the SRA is, is uh, have an accreditation for restaurants around sustainability called Food Made Good. And I think one of the things that we wrestle with is that, um, is that question of obviously, then it requires, to, to understand how a restaurant works and, and the sustainability mechanisms, you need to understand a lot about the restaurant. Uh, you know, Chantal's been through, been through the, the audit before. Um, and I think, you know, it requires us to understand a lot about how your, how your business runs. And it's that balance, right, between um, maybe a future that allows for that transparency um, and gets into that nitty gritty on, understanding um, you know, what you're doing with your waste, how you're sourcing your ingredients, how you're treating your staff. Um, you know, full disclosure, we do the same for the, the sustainability award at the 50 Best um, and, and feel quite proud about the fact that within that one award, we ask a lot of questions that other awarding bodies don't ask. Now, we love, would love the idea that those should be prerequisite questions <laughs> for having to win one of these awards rather than optional questions. Um, because they should be something that everyone should have to... So if you win the sustainability award at the World's 50 Best, you've had to disclose how many unpaid interns you have in your kitchen and stuff. So I think these are, these are interesting things about how do you move forward a conversation that creates some base level, that creates some uh, shared, shared terminology and shared understanding about what these sustainable metrics are um, in a way that helps to take away the subjectivity because I think... Um, with a word like sustainability, it's so big that it can mean everything and therefore it can mean nothing. Um, so hoping to kind of push some objectivity into it to say, no, there actually are some metrics that we know matter uh, for the sake of the planet. We, there are some metrics that we know are important. Uh, eliminating waste is one of those really important metrics. Reducing our footprint is another one. Um, being responsive to farms and what is grown in our local region, all these things. And there are some things that we know contribute to the thriving of people. So why can't we be a little bit more uh, objective with restaurants as opposed to subjective? And with that, I guess we're getting towards the end of our conversation. Um, I would love to hear from each of you something about fine dining that you really hope dies with this kind of trend and movement into the future. Um, and something that you hope that we start seeing as a trend across the industry, not just here in London, but maybe kind of globally when thinking about this upper echelon of restaurants. Give you a moment to think. I got a good one. Go, go, uh, what go. I, what I hate, um, just because uh, yeah, I had to do it for so long. Um, unnecessary prepping of vegetables. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I spent um, yes. one summer of my yeah on on the fish section. I was I was all pumped up. I went out and bought a new knife, and um, the head chef decided to put um, asparagus on, but French trim. Oh, oh god. Um, and I I honestly spent uh, four and a half hours a day just peeling asparagus oh. and then if I ever tried to get away with it and get someone to help me I get called up middle of service what the hell is this my one of those was peeling peanuts oh and, uh, <laughs> awful. That made my fingers almost bleed it's horrible oh. a nightmare um, but um, unnecessary peeling is like almost as bad as yeah, when we wrap picking microherbs bananas in, um, into plastic or something yeah. Yeah, exactly. But microherbs that arrive on the day that die on the day um, in a yeah. plastic pot yeah. is so sad. Yeah, so terrible. All right. Oh, yeah. Unnecessary veg prep. Yes. Um, how about something that you would like to see take off as a trend? I think it's a bit contentious, but I think the 48-hour work week, we're at 52 hours yeah. for chefs at the moment. Um, yeah. We're trying to get it to 48, but it's, not, it's just not feasible right now. Uh, but, but it's something we're working towards. Yeah, um, love It's it. something that we're, yeah, we're not there yet, but for us, it's an ambition yeah. uh, to be able to still say that we do all our own bread and all the, you know, we still don't buy anything in and we still butcher everything, but uh, 48 hours is, is, is a sweet spot, I think, for staff. Love for, that. In, the, in the kitchen, yeah. I love that. And mm -hmm. I would say that from the kind of traveling I've been doing all over the world, I feel like that was the biggest thing that okay. chefs are grappling yeah. with in the conversations I've been having, like how to make that work in Mexico and in uh, Hong Kong and, you know, what does a reduced work week look like that still is ambitious and uh, productive for a restaurant? 
Love that. Ideas, Isaac? Uh, for me, it's kind of um, the competition between restaurants need to change. We need to, we, we don't have like a, a body properly representing us, I think. So I think yeah. in this kind of, so we need to, you know, you mentioned VAT earlier on, which made my squid and crawl. We need to have someone that can represent us and as an industry pretty much and help us move forward. It's obviously very hard because if we go on strike, no one really cares, to be honest. So we need to, um, <laughs> we need to I, I mean, I don't know the answer myself. I don't know who's going to help us. But for me, it would be, you know, get rid of this kind of individualization of restaurants and come together as, a, as, a, as an industry. Controversially, I think that if restaurants actually all went on strike, people care massively because I think it's restaurants that make cities mm. thrive. So I, I, I think, you know, potentially your two ideas are a bit linked because... Are you putting your hand up to lead this strike, <laughs> are you? <laughs> Got a lot on my plate. Um, but no, one of the, well, I think one of the biggest challenges is that, uh, you know, linked to your 48-hour work week is that... Um, partially, we need more chefs speaking for yourselves. Um, you don't need more, you don't need a body or a person like me. We need more representatives. Um, we I think need we more... need the media to listen. And the media, yeah, that's true. Ask the people that are actually in their businesses, not the ones that have yeah. so many faces on TV. Yeah, yes, yes. I think that's that. And I think, um, I think what's hard about that is the fact that you guys are in your restaurants all the time and, um, and that it's needed in order for, because the economics mean that it's needed. And so I think these things are actually more interlinked than maybe they appear on the surface and that getting a more um, diverse set of voices out in the media that can tell different narratives, um, which is challenging and, you know, has been, is, is, challenging always and it's a challenge we face when we're trying to talk to get new voices into the conversation because you know you guys didn't necessarily sign up to be public speakers you signed up to be <laughs> chefs um so yeah i think those two things are maybe more linked than you think Chantal. yeah i think definitely the um I completely agree with the beach like it, it break it literally breaks my heart whenever i see anyone peel asparagus um <laughs> it just it's just Terrific. Um, I think the, yeah, gosh, there's so many things that I think that I was trained to do that I'm just now, I think, what on earth? Like, why? Um, and I think for me, the, the, the one is that, that true, for people to understand the true value of food and how it got even into their kitchen and how many people were involved in that process of getting that carrot, of getting that, you know, that... Anything, whether it's a, a a banana or a carrot or a amazing, you know, a truffle or caviar, it's like there's so many people involved in that process that never get, you know, it's like cherished and actually yeah. understanding how it got to you and, and the whole, you know, rejecting something because it's not exactly the same, like right. is also quite heartbreaking in some ways when you think of the amount of people and. You know, in some ways, bread's actually a really good example because you do, you know, bread is, it's a living, breathing thing. Some days it's going to be this big, some days it's going to be this big. As long as it's delicious and you can kind of understand that there's so many factors at play. Right. Um, and I remember <laughs> just having to, you know, having to call this incredible bakery when I was, this is going back a few years, and just saying, no, sorry, we're not, like, we can't use this bread um, can we have a can we have a refund for today? And it was just that this is just ludicrous yeah. when you think back now because actually the amount of people that were involved in that process and it was still delicious bread. Yes, it may have been a bit wonky or something, but just the whole disrespect of right. what had gone into that amazing natural product. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's both kind of getting rid of this whole it's not good enough um, and embracing the imperfection because like as chefs that's that's what we do. We love food. We love cooking. And we, you know, like Ivan, I love the challenge of, of not being able to, of saying, right, actually, we're only going to use these ingredients because they're in season. Right. We're not going to just use what we do. So how can we, like, really, really think about how we use things to actually, and then you do, you create interesting, you know, some of them are a bit wacky, some of them are delicious, some of them not so delicious, but then you get into these really interesting things, and that's, that's how we just keep evolving. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, because I think, I think your point almost wraps us up perfectly because it ties into the fact that 
A, being more responsive to these imperfect ingredients in this imperfect food system, valuing our food going forward. But that final point about the ingenuity of a chef, and I think ties back to what feels like the largest theme in our conversation, which has been about people and how we create an industry that thrives. Um, got a bit of an analogy that it might be a bit of a walk, but, let, but I'm going to go with it. Um, you know that story about the pilot, Sully, that, that landed plane on the Hudson River in New York? And when that happened, there was, all, there was a lot of, um, of articles about how he was a trained fighter pilot and, and there, therefore had this experience to be able to land a plane once the technology had gone down. And how actually how we train pilots now is mostly on machines and that actually like a newer trained pilot might not be able to land the plane in those contexts. And it feels a little bit like that with chefing, that like... If we're, if we're disrespecting our staff and we're paying people poorly and we're creating a food system in which people are expected to kind of shoot out the same food day in and day out, then we don't have a workforce that is creative enough and reflexive enough to meet the actual needs of the food system that we're going to have and that we're finding ourselves already potentially with because of the impacts of climate. So that sort of creating a staff in an industry that thrives is what allows us to have that creativity, that reflexivity, that allows our chefs and our restaurants to thrive in the conditions in which we have a food system that is constantly changing. I love that analogy. It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> and I'll leave you with that for tonight. My, my thoughts on pilots and chefing. No, um, if we have any kind of quick questions for the panel, I'm conscious that we've already gone past 7 o'clock. Um, but happy to take any questions that we've got for the panel. Go for it. Um, it's just around, um, Hi. <laughs> um, sustainability in terms of kind of future-proofing workforces and, you know, either kind of what do you guys do or what are your thoughts on how we, we you, bring talent into mm. the industry, like young talent, like how, how do you think or how do you guys go about that or how do you think the industry should go about it? I think certain TV shows should be banned. <laughs> First of all, I, yeah, I honestly think that um, there's a, a view that a lot of people have from certain TV shows that that's what the industry is. And I think it's, that's now, well, I'm hoping now, that's probably maximum kind of 10, 15% of it. Um, but I do feel that I've always kind of had this theory that I think, you know, if young people are saying to their parents, oh, I want to be a chef, and, they, and they've seen that show, they'll be like, mm, maybe let's, let's think about doing something else instead. Yeah. Um, so I think that it does, yeah, I think it's a huge, you know, there's no shows about how lovely it is and how, you know, interesting it is to come and work in one of our kitchens or to do something that's, you know, that teaches you so many skills um, more than any other industry. So I, I feel that there's, yeah, for me, it's like starting on that younger generation to get them excited and interested yeah. in that. Well, yeah, we, we, we have apprentices, um, and yeah. they're, they're awesome. They're really, really good. They're, they're, they're now, like, you know, running sections and stuff. Um, we work really hard on that. But, but one thing that we've got, um, well, we started, it's, it's pretty recent, is this um, YouTube channel where we just film on our chests um, the actual service. That's cool. And, um, yeah, like... Um, we still edit out swear words occasionally, but, but it does give you a very, very realistic portrayal of just what it is to be in a kitchen. And there's no, you know, we're an open kitchen, and you know, to be honest, we're a nice team, so there's no shouting. But we, I, I get lots of messages from young chefs who want to get into the industry from that. Uh, so we've just found that it's quite a niche, but it, it's quite unique. And we've got a younger demographic of people who have obviously engaged with YouTube as, a, as one of their main mediums. Um, yeah, see them liking what they see and, and trying to get into the industry. So, you know, that's worked for us. Yeah, for me, it's about creating a connection to the industry. I think, like, back to what you said about the vegetables and, and caring for carrots. Like we, we, we can't care for something that we're not connected to. And I think a lot of children growing up now have no connection to the environment at all. And I, I went to university with a business degree. I had no intention of being a chef at all. But when my parents moved out of London, I kind of found this connection to the wild ingredients. And that's what I loved. I, was, I didn't know what an elderflower or a pheasant was. I was eating quavers and wagon wheels like everyone else when I was growing up um, but I, I developed that connection to this environment and for me that's when I fell in love with it and I was like okay what am I going to do with this stuff and I started off making like jams and chutneys with it then onto pies and the public restaurants but it was that kind of love for the environment that 
that made me want to be a chef. So for me, it's important, like your YouTube videos, creating that connection, creating that, that care for the ingredients. We work with a charity called Farms for City Children, um, which is Michael Mapurgo's charity, who's an author, and it's an amazing, amazing charity that takes inner city kids from London, Bristol, and sends them out to farms for a week. And it's like no hold bars, they have no phones out there, they have to muck out the pigs and everything is brilliant. And they get a whole week to create this connection to the environment. Because I went down there and they didn't know a carrot come out of the ground, they didn't know anything about the animals and that. You know, they come back and the, you go on the website, some of the, like, the sort of testimonials that the kids come back and say, you know, mum, I did this, I want to be a farmer. And when I was down there, the kid was telling me his tartar sauce recipe and stuff like that, it's brilliant. Like, <laughs> Love Stuff it. like that is absolutely yeah. amazing for me. It's to create that that connection to the to yeah. our environment, really. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Yes, go ahead. You go first. Um, hello, I was just wondering, like, you know, you're talking about some of the things that you know you'd like to change the way that people think about dining or think about restaurants, and what can we, as people who enjoy dining and people who enjoy restaurants? Or, you know, you might have like a little food blog or might be part, you know, a micro-influencer or whatever. What can we do to help move things in a positive direction? Turn up. I think yeah. most, most, <laughs> most customers that don't turn up is the worst, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, blogs and, and social media obviously helps our business massively. It's, it's like a huge change since it's there and, you know, I think a lot of us get frustrated over, you know, if, if we do something technically wrong, then you can criticise on a blog, but if, we, if it's your opinion, then, you know, state it as your opinion. You might not like something, but again, that's your opinion. And I think, you know, try and keep everything as positive as you can, unless you have a truly terrible, terrible experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the biggest problem we have in industry is, is customers not turning up. To yeah, restaurants, absolutely. so as much as you can sort of support. I think we, with, in fine dining in particular, I think we need to move to this view now that going for a, a high-end meal is an experience, <laughs> like going to the cinema, like going to a football match. You commit to going, ticketed. it should be ticketed. Yeah, 100%. That's why I think it needs to be the future, really. Yeah. I think that's so interesting because I think, uh, you know, obviously culturally, supper clubs are ticketed, and we've kind of started to understand that as a thing, that if you buy a ticket to a supper club then and you miss it, you lose out on your ticket price. Um, but we're not culturally there yet with restaurants and meals, but... Um, I know Clove Club tried. Does Clove Club still do it? They tried it. Yeah, they still do it. Yeah. Um, might be the only ones that I can think of in London. Yeah, the Fat Ducks done it yeah. since they reopened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. So I think that's an interesting <laughs> point. Leave a, leave a good Google review is a small thing. It, it is mm. such a small thing, but the way that the, the system... Yeah. It's important for us as a business because we're in a tourist area and about 35% of our trade comes from... Um, walk-ins from that tourist area or last-minute bookings. Um, sometimes on a Sunday night we can pick up by like, um, yeah, 50 covers, and I think it's mainly wow. to do with us having a 4.6. When you get a one-star review, um, it's it's really, really, really damaging. It can take, it like, the amount of resources we put to, to remove a one-star is, is a lot. So if you enjoy an experience, just give it. Just give it a five star. I think is a, is a, is a nice thing to do. Uh, it makes it, it. It might not sound. It might sound trivial. Trivial, but like, even if you're a micro influencer, doing your own post is is awesome. Like, absolutely. But um, yeah, Google is is has a massive monopoly on on driving foot traffic, especially to our business. Not sure about everyone else's, but it it, yeah. it, it matters to us. I think that's an interesting point for all of you guys to take away from this because I think often we think about using our voices on social media when things go wrong and you don't and, and restaurants don't often hear when things go right and mm. so taking that moment to share <laughs> the positive story and the, the when it went right thing is a really positive step last question last question um, number one thank you newfound respect <laughs> 50 plus hours in three and a half days that's extraordinary so more than 15 percent tip is really deserved and I've got three nights out. I'm now going to plan to come to your restaurants. Amazing. Very quick question related to the first one, which is about young chefs coming up. What's your one piece of advice to them now on what they can do to get into a place like yours to try and find these kind of experiences you can offer? I think just contacting. If you find somewhere that looks good, just email them. And if they get back to you, 
then they're going to be a good they're going to be a good place. Um, I think that's probably what I would say. If they don't get back to you, then that's that's what I would say. Um, and seek it out because I think you know even if we don't have a position, we'll always invite someone in to come and spend a day with us. And then if they're great, then when we do have a position, yeah. they'll be the first port of call. Um, so I think always just yeah just kind of being inquisitive and being curious is really important as well. But when I always get when I get trials in there and I'm like, did you have a good day? Did you enjoy everything? They're always like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, definitely want to come work here. I'm like, well, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> Go and do three other trials and make sure you're right. Make sure this place is, you know, well, I mean, we do volume, so you know, I'm, I always say, you know, I always bump up the covers a little bit so they're, they're prepared for it. Um, but there's a mass, there's so many different restaurants out there, and if you're a young chef, you're in such an amazing position right now. Like, you know, to get the job that I got, I had to go around every, loads of restaurants, like traditionally, with um, my knives on my back and have my notice, and 90% and of the places didn't get back to me. Now, you know, they'd be in the door, in the kitchen within 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I always say to the guys, like, look, I know you've had a great day, but please go away, go to a Michelin star restaurant, go to a two Michelin star restaurant, go to a brasserie, and then make a decision. Um, and if you're in work, Take, a, take two days holiday and do a stage. Uh, I, I staged everywhere before. Um, I decided to open, open Fallow. Um, I think that's really, I think it's good advice because I think um, for young chefs, you want to get your feet in the ground somewhere. So it's one thing just learning the sections, learning what to, how to cook a piece of fish, learning how to cook a steak, but how to manage a team, how to manage orders, how to look out your GP. That only comes when you're in a senior, more senior management position. That only comes after two to three years. So, dig, yeah, dig your feet in the ground and decide, make a good decision about where you want to be for, for two or three or four years. It's a tough one. It? I think most kitchens will take anyone at the moment. <laughs> we, need, we need staff. Um, I, yeah, one, I think working in the kitchen is 80, 90% just your work ethic. You don't have to be skilled, have to know everything about food when you walk in there. You know, for me, it's, there's always a job to do. If you're standing still, you should never be standing still. You should pick up a broom, sweep. There's always a job to do. And you'll gradually learn the skills you need. So you don't have to come in gun ho saying you know everything. And I think the worst thing we always hear is, oh, in my last kitchen, this is what I, I did. Yeah. You, know, you never want to hear that. Um, so, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, be a sponge. Absorb everything. Absorb the way people work. And you'll just naturally start picking up habits. And, I mean, and... and I mean, you'll find this a, a great industry to work in, pretty much. Like I said, I didn't had no intention of being a chef, and I, I, I can't get enough of it. I, I, don't think, I don't think I'll do anything else. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And with that, we will let. You, oh, I've got one question. Go. Um, okay. Last question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, one of my um, issues with the restaurant industry being controversial, maybe looking around the room, thinking it might be the only one who's thinking that, or only a few of us, is that all the emphasis is on the young people. What about older people who might want to go and work in the in restaurant industry? I mean, like, I was in Paris recently, um, you know, Bruno Vergio became a chef at 53. And what about all the people, you know, us fortunate ones, if we're not journalists, you know, the baby boomers, we're the ones who've got the money, most, well, most of my mates have, you know, to go, out, to go out and eat quite a lot. But I find that a lot of the press and a lot of the restaurants and a lot of everything is all geared towards much younger people. And the people who are really keeping restaurants alive, I would say, are the people, you know, in their 50s and 60s. And I just don't think you really think about, you know, what they might want. Like, not such loud music for a start. <laughs> no, I massively agree. I think my greatest experience I had in a restaurant was in Venice, and all the waiting staff were kind of like 65-year-old men in their bow ties and suits, and they were so proud to work in there, and I, it's always stuck with me. I've, you know, wish it was more like that in the UK, but they're, they're not the people that are applying for jobs at my restaurant, unfortunately. I get kind of young, younger people. I'd love to have people that could... Teach me stuff is, is what I always want because you know I've got a narrow-minded point of view of native and that's how it needs to run. If I could hire people that could teach me, it, it would be brilliant. Yeah, um, but that's the people that I get applying for my jobs. Pretty much are kind of a lot of people out of college. Pretty much. I think they've all become consultants. Isn't <laughs> is it, is what, is my genuine think, thought. I think to to wrap it all up and tie tie together, you know, all of your points about how we inspire people 
also means that we need to create longevity in careers in restaurants. And so we need restaurants that are places where you can thrive, where you don't have to quit when you're 35 because you're too tired and you're burnt out. And also you don't have to quit the job because you've got kids at home and it's not sociable and it's not manageable. And so we need to shift to creating an industry where you can thrive for a longer career. <laughs> Um, and again, in that future proofing, a place where the environment can thrive as well, um, and we can be kind of responsive to what the world's going to look like in 10, 15 years' time. And with that, we'll let you guys go on about your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.